So first today we'll be hearing from Laura. Laura Treishman is the State Historic Preservation Officer, a position she was appointed to in 2013. She recently told me she's the longest serving SHPO. And uh, as Director of the Division for Historic Preservation, she oversees a team, a team of 14 workers, four Vermonters, on the national and state registers of historic places, project review for state and federal funded projects, rehabilitation investment tax credits, preservation and barn grants, roadside historic site markers, underwater preserves, and state-owned historic sites, to name just a few. She addresses disasters and resiliency at the 24 state historic sites consisting of 84 buildings, sites, and bridges, is the regulatory reviewer of projects for historic buildings owned by the state from the State House to the Welcome Centers, and is chair of the Historic and Cultural Restoration Task Force Annex. Our second speaker, Deborah Howe, has been involved in the field of book conservation and book arts for 30 plus years. Currently, she is the collections conservator at Dartmouth College Library in Hanover, New Hampshire, where she also teaches repair workshops for local organizations and book arts classes in the library's book arts workshop. Previously, she headed the conservation lab at Northwestern University Library in Evanston, Illinois. She is a regular attendee at the American Institute of Conservation annual conferences, and in her capacity as a teacher, she has taught classes at Columbia Center for Paper and Book, the Newberry Library, and the Paper and Book Intensive. She is a long-standing member of the Guild of Book Workers and is on the board of directors of the Morgan Art of Papermaking Conservatory and Educational Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you both. Laura, you gonna start us off? Thank you, thank you very much, Rachel and Deborah. Um, the rain started on July 7th, which was my birthday. And it didn't stop at all for weeks at a time. It just kept coming. I remember waking up in the middle of the night yelling out the window, just stop raining. Um, but it wouldn't stop. We work in the agency of commerce and community development. We're housing, we're businesses, we're tourism and marketing. Our entire agency was told to stay put. We deploy usually two weeks after an event. While it was still raining on that Monday, the commissioner of building and general services called me and said, where are you? This was 6.30 in the morning. And I was like, well, am I on my way to Montpelier? And she's like, yes, yes you are. I spent an entire week in Montpelier, up to my waist in water, watching what was coming out of basements guiding and organizing things. And I have to say this was learning on the ground because I had no idea days later I would be the one running it all at a state historic site. The Justin Morrill State Historic Site was built in the 1850s. This was designed by Senator Justin Morrill. Bottom of a hill, ice pond up above. He built underwater channels to feed his, um, his crops and his cows and feed, get water to the house. It is the bane of his existence and I curse him all the time because, right Fred? Everything drains down into the house. The house is constantly wet. For decades we were just replacing the plaster every year. It would freeze in the winters. We knew we had a drainage problem. We applied for a uh, Save America's Treasures grant, which we actually received to fix the drainage, and we're gonna be closed next year as we rip up the whole site to fix this drainage. This is the only way we're gonna be able to save this house. So water was constantly on our minds. We had our friends group run over to the site while we were in Montpelier and say, okay, everything's dry, it's great. The Friday after the flooding started, our director of preservation and I said, we should just go to our historic sites. And his wife's like, no, I don't think so. 
because roads were missing, we didn't know how to get there, dams were breaching. She's like, the only one I'll let you go to is Morrill, because we could get there relatively easily. It turns out some of the roads were gone, um, with Jamie hanging out the window directing me, okay, to the left, there's more road. And <laughs> Um, what happened here was completely unforeseen. We expected to get water in the main house, the homestead, because it's always damp. Water's always going down there. Rain's always coming in. We also got water at the Theron Boyd house, which was built in 1786 over in Quiche. Phenomenal resource that has not been touched since the 1820s. That's the good part about state government, not having any money. We didn't screw it up. It's an amazing, amazing jewel box. Old Constitution House, pre-1777. You're getting the theme here. Everything really historic got hammered. Um, we learned Old, Con Old Constitution House in Windsor is actually in a floodplain. We didn't know that. And now they're like, well, you need to elevate it. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> So I'm fighting with flood managers on elevating that building. This is Vermont's first National Historic Landmark. There are only 18 in Vermont. This means a great deal to us. The story this property has to tell. So, of course, Jamie runs, director of preservation, runs to the homestead and he's like, it's wet, there's water coming in, but it's not flooding. I started noticing the bridges along the stream, the unnamed stream, I've got other names for it, but um, there are stone walkway bridges over it, and I could tell those had been breached. I could tell from the landscaping that it had been breached. On that Friday, I had no idea how badly it had been breached. And then, of course, the education center, which was built in 2007, I hate this building. I have always hated this building, and now I hate it even more. <laughs> this was built in 2007 with beautiful designs to make it a community building. It holds historic books that belong to Morrill, that now belong to the town. It is where the friends have their offices. It's a community center where people have meetings. So it's a really important resource. It's a reconstruction of the back of that building. Everything that's a reconstruction is painted that lovely barn red. Everything else is moral pink. We went into the education center. We never went into the basement at first because we're like, okay, everything's good here. Jamie's, Jamie is um, the bird in the, the, the canary in the coal mine. Right? We're standing there talking like, okay, I think we dodged a bullet. Maybe we do need to. We just won't tell your wife. We'll go to the Kent Museum in Callis because the dam's going to go there. We need to go to Theron Boyd, which we knew would flood because that flooded during Tropical Storm Irene. During Irene here, we had $1,400 worth of damage that FEMA reimbursed us for. We bought toilet paper. There was nothing to fix. But this time, Jamie's like, I'm having trouble breathing. And I'm like, well, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, there's something wrong in this building. So he goes upstairs, I go downstairs, and I start screaming, like, Jamie, we've got a problem. So I'll start with the, the homestead. Um, this is where the water came in, the side of the building. It compromised the foundation. It compromised the very lovely and not historic bulkhead that does lead to historic stairs that were all out of whack. Then I will add, in the winter, the ground never gave up of the water. It froze. The foundation, the stairs, everything moved even more. So we had water damaged exterior siding because the building's very used to just sucking up the water. The basement windows were damaged. The bulkhead was damaged. You can see this does have a uh, septic 
or uh, sub pump, excuse me, in the back. And you can see everything's very wet. You can see part of the foundation bowing out. It's even worse now from the freezing. And it doesn't go back. <laughs> And to repair this, we have to take the whole wall out and rebuild it. Um, but how do we deal with this immediately, right? We had to get engineers to the building. Like, we can't lose this building. Then, as I mentioned, the unnamed stream. These are the walkways. Um, gorgeous but they stopped everything from coming down. We had trees, we had all sorts of damage coming through. When we finally a week later had our entire team at the site, we were looking for the drains that come from the education center over to this stream. Devin Coleman, who was the state archi uh, architectural historian, stands 6'3". He had a huge broom handle and he's pushing it along trying to find where the outlet for the water is, hoping that it's just a clog and that's why the education center is full. The broom handle completely disappeared because there was nothing underneath it. The water had just taken everything underneath. So he's yelling, stop! And it's like freeze tag and like what? <laughs> so we had to block off this is the beginning of a trailhead. People needed to be outside to enjoy Vermont, to remember why we live here and just think about something else. We had people coming and we kept saying, this is dangerous, you can't walk here. We also didn't know how far the damage was and we didn't want anything caving in because we knew cave-ins were possible. The week that I spent down behind the Secretary of State's offices in the parking lot on State Street, all of a sudden I'm like, where'd that hole come from? Sinkholes were happening in the parking lot as we were standing there all afternoon. So I just had visions of that happening here and losing a Vermonter in a sinkhole. My team likely thought it was me, so they had me in fluorescent yellow <laughs> and a hard hat. <laughs> so the beloved education center has many doors, thankfully. This is what we found. There are three steps down to the basement. The water was all the way up to the stairs. We pumped out close to 18,000 gallons of water. The one thing I will say is, don't be shy when you're in an emergency like this. Not only are you calling all your best friends, like Rachel, I'm like crying on the phone to Rachel, what do I do? And she's deploying people like Deborah and telling me what I need. But you also can't be shy for help. We called many people, we need this pumped out because we've got to get everything out of there. Everyone's busy. There's not many people who do this. I was calling in favors that weren't even my own, right? The first person I had signed this project to was just emailing. Well, I sent an email. I'm like, no, this is why you have a state phone. Use it. Then I got my most obnoxious staff person to start calling. <laughs> and they showed up immediately. She also got us a dumpster that came at 6.30 in the morning. But you can see the refrigerator. And I can't tell you how many times during this flooding I saw refrigerators at this angle. At the Arts Council offices, the Welcome Center, Secretary of State. This happens. This basement has no way out. There is no drains. There are no windows. There is no sump pump. We had no idea how the water got in because it has a drain around it, like a moat, where the water's supposed to go. Something was blocking it and overwhelming it. But we didn't know that. So we had a choreographed removal. And I felt very vindicated after the fabulous talk this morning because I did a lot of what she was telling us right. 
even though people thought that it was complete chaos, it wasn't. I had the whole thing organized and I had people coming. You told us to be here at 11. We want to come now at 9. I'm like, no. This is all figured out. So we had the basement where the Stratford Historical Society stuff, unfortunately, and I walked past it so I take blame, went from the floor to the ceiling. It never should have been down there. We can't even find how it got down there. We were storing it temporarily for them. Then at 11 o'clock, I wanted the friends of the Moral Homestead to come because the basement, fortunately, the way it was laid out, the first things by the door were the historical societies, then the friends, then our stuff. So I knew by having people come at set times, nobody would get in the way. We also had a buddy system. So everybody had a partner that they could keep eyes on. And it was always like, well, where's Elizabeth? She's right here. You know, where's Cindy? I got her right here. So we all knew where each other was. During the whole flood, we never went anywhere alone, which mattered. Not only for emotional support, but for safety. We also had the first floor books. These are morals books. These are books that belong to us and the town library. They were on the first floor. The first floor wasn't wet. But I was thinking, what next? We also had the second floor, which was the office space. I knew this building was coming out of commission. I knew nobody was going to be in this building for a while. We needed to understand this building. I've never liked the second floor. I'm very sensitive to spaces. And the second floor always bounced to me. And everyone's like, no, no, it's just the curved walls and it's all white. That's what's throwing you off. I'm like, okay. Engineers came and they're like, who built this thing? <laughs> you can only have four people up on the second floor. It is not safe. And I was like, I told you this building was horrible. So we have what my father calls an all skate. That means everybody's there. Everybody from the state historic sites, everybody from the Division for Historic Preservation, we were all there. The friends, the historical society, the library, Vakdarn, neighbors, the seasonal staff. This is where we called everyone. I don't care what you had scheduled for those days. The only person who wasn't there was the one that was on vacation. But otherwise, we were all there. We were all there every day long days. And people had assignments. I had somebody who was in charge of getting food because she was the one that would send emails to get help, right? You go get food because you're better at that. You figure out what people's strengths are and it comes out in emergencies like this. You're in charge of getting the dumpster. You're in charge of getting the, the vac darn supplies up here, things like that. So we have three doors the basement stuff that was wet was coming out one door, and it was with tables stationed for the three groups, the historical society, the friends, and then us. Then we had the second floor was coming out another door on the other side of the building that was dry. This is where everything that was not wet was coming out. Thank goodness for Miss Rachel Onoff, because I was like, what am I gonna do? I have got hundreds of thousands of historic books I need out of this building. Mold is gonna move in here immediately. We already had mold in the homestead, so I knew I couldn't move them there temporarily. I needed them off the property. She calls the state library. The books are actually here. We got a U-Haul truck. They brought us boxes. We had everything loaded up into boxes, inventoried as it was going out, and it has been stored here ever since. And it's good because now this building's closed due to extreme mold. The second floor, as I said, had more books, offices, clothing that belonged to the morals from the 1850s to 1905. We also needed to get that out. Um, we moved all of their furniture, we got all of their files, everything was taken out. Another door at the bottom of the stairs where the star is so that it wouldn't interfere 
There were staging areas. There were people assigned to do certain things. And there's always got to be somebody in charge. While it might look like chaos, and it was, right? I'm not saying this was run perfectly, but I had eyes on everything to figure out what was going on and who was doing what and who needed what. You can see historic books. Some of these books actually have Justin Morrill's handwriting in them. He loved to write in his books and make notes. These are the books that helped him design his house, design his property. He was the first longest serving senator in US history. He was friends with Abraham Lincoln. Um, he was a pretty important man. So we knew we needed to get these books out and stored. These books mattered and half of them weren't ours. So we had responsibility for stuff that didn't belong to us but had been in the building. So again, it might look like chaos, but it, <laughs> it, it was. So as I said, we had tables with the historical society taking care of things over at the far end. We had the U-Haul where the books were coming in boxes around them being loaded up. Artwork that had been on the second floor was coming down from the other side, going into the front of the U-Haul or into our cars. Um, all the clothing actually ended up here at the Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center. And it's still here. I'm afraid to move anything back. Um, we brought out, these are, <laughs> these are archival documents that belong to the Division for Historic Preservation. We scanned those nine, ten, uh, eight, nine years ago. According to the rules of archives, we could toss these, and this was our opportunity. Probably 5% of them were wet, but we have them scanned. We have them digitally. We don't have to keep these, so we just got rid of them. That was the bulk of what was being thrown away. Um, and then we had some books, unfortunately, that got damaged, that were wet. And so we laid those out away from the historical society so that things weren't getting mixed and confused. They were in the sun drying out. They eventually went with Deborah Dartmouth um, and were taken care of. We also found some things that we'd been hoarding, right? None of this belonged to the, <laughs> belonged to the just immoral state historic site. And I kept saying, why is this here? It turns out that it had Chimney Point written on it, which is another state historic site. Didn't belong there either. It turns out it belonged to state parks in a building that they had gotten. They didn't want it, so they gave it to Chimney Point. Chimney Point's like, we're a tavern. Why do we have all this stuff? Send it to Morrill. Morrill didn't need it. We had Morrill's real china, so it was just put in the basement. So instead of boxing it up, I'm like, OK, who wants what? <laughs> This is where your team really matters, and you've got to have a strong team. They were bringing stuff up out of the basement, piles of what was going to be trashed that we actually went through before the dumpster showed up, so we knew what was in there. We knew what had accidentally gotten in there. I stayed right around this area because I was like, yeah, that can go. That needs to be saved. Put that in. Elizabeth's car, put that in my car. And we had the team, only certain people were allowed in the building because I wanted to make sure they were safe. And you could smell the water. So here they are down in the basement. They look really happy, right? Um, this is Jamie and Devin. We bought our own pumps after the initial water was pumped up. My feet were soaking wet. I put on my cute little shoes and I went down to check on them. Okay, let's have lunch. You guys ready? Let's get something to drink. And then I'm like, why are my feet wet? There's water rising. For three whole weeks, water kept coming back into the building. This is the line, this dark line shows you how high it got initially. 
but water kept coming in. It was seeping in right here at the corner. There's no other way to get water into that building other than through the concrete foundation, which was just sucking it in like a sponge. So we kept having to go back. We've got dehumidifiers and fans and all sorts of things happening in this building, and the two of them constantly pumping out water. Again, there's no drain, so they had to carry the water up the stairs and throw it out. What we found was the drain had trees in it, roots growing in it, because trees like water. Why not go right to the source? And the very small drains, I'm talking small, that went around the building were completely overwhelmed by the storm. There were rocks. There were all sorts of things in them. They are too small. This building, the engineer told us, was not built to design. It was underbuilt. They basically went to Home Depot, bought some pine, put it together, and then said, oh, you'll be great. This building was never supposed to flood, but this is the worst that we had. They dug up the driveway, and of course, you know, I've got three archaeologists on my team. You're doing what? You're digging where? You can't do that. <laughs> like, yeah, you need to take a holiday because I'm digging up the driveway. <laughs> Within minutes, the basement was completely dry. It took about 10 minutes for all the water to go once they cut the pipe, put whole new pipes in, filled up the hole again. And here's our dumpster with our fearless leader that we found in the basement. <laughs> Our next step for my beloved education center is the mold remediation. This is on serious delay. So you need to plan ahead, but you need to know ahead is not tomorrow. We are well over a year out, and we have not gotten the mold taken care of. And that's because there are not enough people that do this work. The mold at first when they came was like, oh, it's not that bad. We'll be able to take care of it, and we'll get you in the queue. Then when they came back, they were like, oh, crap, this is a lot worse. But schools were getting ready to open, so they were all busy with schools. We're installing a sump pump in the basement. I don't care if this building was designed never to flood. I don't care if we figured out how to fix the drains. We are putting a sump pump. We are dry flood floodproofing this basement. I am putting a metal door right where the water went up to, a big cage door that says, no, nothing. Nothing goes down here. Let it flood. We are elevating the HVAC that's in the basement, putting it a little bit higher. It'll still remain in the basement, but it'll be higher. And of course, we had flood alarms. They weren't working. The security system at this site has been a challenge for us from the start, and the flood alarms had been turned off. Why? This building never floods. There's no way for water to get in. And then at the homestead site, um, we're actually going to drop our um, public assistance request with FEMA for the, the house itself. We're going to keep going for the um, stream and the education center but it is just not worth the squeeze. The juice we're getting, they were like, oh, we'll figure out how much it'll cost you to fix all of that on your 1851 house. They came back with an estimate of $16,000, and I was like, I've already spent that just getting rid of the water. So it's just not worth it in this particular instance. Um, we already have a drainage project, so we've got federal money coming anyway. Um, we're going to have to reconstruct the foundation. Um, and then we're going to have to deal with the stream restoration, which the stream feeds down to a tiny little culvert under the road that goes to another culvert on the other side that leads to a small little pipe, kind of the size of your dryer vent, that leads to someone's backyard. 
um, that's supposed to make its way to the river, but it doesn't. So the town had already put in their public assistance request, not realizing they had this undersized culvert. So we're gonna work with them together to get this to be a much bigger culvert. So when this stream gets inundated, it can just go, and it won't go to this poor person's backyard. Did their house flood? Did their house, no. No, thankfully. What did we learn? No basement is flood proof. No basement is flood proof. Store nothing in your basements. I even remember giving the Secretary of State a wiggle of the finger as it was still raining and we were pulling stuff out of their basement going, don't put anything in the basement. Let's lock the door. She's like, you're absolutely right. Our mistake. And here I did the exact same thing. I apologize to her. Um, you have to go and monitor your interiors every time it's raining and then when things freeze. We have fantastic seasonal staff who live right in town. They are constantly checking these resources for us. And they are going into the flood-proof basement to make sure it does not flood. We also had a Vacdarn box brought up to us immediately. It was regularly stored at the um, Calvin Coolidge State Historic Site in Plymouth. So the site administrator brought it up to us. Um, it was in the building. We were all sitting on these bins during lunch. Yet, the amazing team dealing with the archival stuff that belonged to the Historical Society didn't know we had all of that material there. So there needs to be better communication of what is available, what you have, what you need. Um, and I'm actually setting up those amazing vac darn boxes for all of our state historic sites. So we do not have to wait for somebody to bring it up. We will have it right there and we will all know what's in that box. And then I was the worst offender for this because when we were on State Street in, in Middlebury, all of BGS is wearing those lovely reflecting orange vests, BGS on the back. I'm wearing a t-shirt, jeans. Our director of state historic sites, please put on a vest. Like, no, no, I'll be fine. Then as the parking lot started to cave in, he's like, put on a vest. <laughs> he spent $2,000, bought us all vests, reflective everything, hats, jackets. Um, you can see us from space now. So we've all got them. We have absolutely no excuse. It's for your own safety and it matters and it helps with the buddy system so that you know where your person is. The education was not constructed to plans. We spent extra time and money to get engineers to the building to tell us what the what. Because I kept sharing the plans. I'm like, well, this is how it was designed. And Jamie would look and he's like, no, that's not what happened here. Um, so we now know we have to change how we use that building. Because the basement's gonna be completely off limits, there's no storage there, everyone was then like, oh, we can put it up on the second floor. I'm like, no, you can't. Only four people at a time could be on the second floor when we were moving stuff out. It is good to own industrial dehumidifiers. Have them in your to-go bag, if you will. They matter, they're expensive, but they're worth it. They make a huge difference. The little dehumidifiers you have at your own house, those aren't gonna do anything during the rainy season. They're not gonna do anything during a flood. We killed easily 15 personal dehumidifiers because we were all bringing them from our houses and the next day you'd go back to empty and it'd be dead. It just couldn't handle the water. And even the industrial ones we had at Theron Boyd and Old Constitution House and in the basement of the Morrill House were so old that they just went kaputs because of the flooding. It was way too much for them. So be totally aware of how old your equipment is. Um, 
because that really matters. We had people showing up all over the place and we had Rachel showed up just to give hugs, which was priceless. You know, I'm like, what are you here for? She's like, I'm here to hug. And I'm like, yes, that's what we needed. Um, it matters. Reach out to your community. Like we heard this morning, post it. Ask people to help. Be overwhelmed that you have too many people, but have a plan of how to organize them, what people should be doing. What's your expertise? Okay, you can do this and be over here. But also keep eyes on the people that get kind of lost and overwhelmed or their strengths aren't rising to the occasion. Find them something else to do because there's always something else to do and everyone can benefit from helping. Um, we struggled, we kept the site closed for the entire season. We opened up our other sites because I was also having to worry about them. Some of them got inundated, the ones that are open. Um, we lost some roadside historic site markers we had to go looking for. But months later, I was like, sorry, you lost your marker, you're gonna have to wait till September. Um, but the site is open this year. It's a great place to go, I encourage you to go. Even if you have an eye on flood, Right? Go visit. We can show you the basement. Next year, it will be closed for the big project. And I'm really hoping this helps alleviate a lot of our problems. We should not have been surprised this flooded. We should have been surprised that the education center flooded. But we should have been better prepared. Why are there no drains here? Why are there no, why are there really small drains for water? What, what's with this building? And when I said the second floor bounces, somebody should have listened to me because the second floor bounces. It was not constructed as it should have been. What should have been our cue that the basement was gonna flood. Thank you. Yes, so Deborah was one of those gifts that you get from Rachel Ono. I was regularly in conversation with people at FEMA, National Park Service, because we also had to be in charge of what the state is doing. You know, and I'm driving home from a day at Morrill and they're like, oh, we're gonna tear all the buildings down on State Street that flooded. I'd have to do a UE and go all the way back to Montpelier. To, I don't think so. Um, and helping all of you. So it was really quite a challenge. And I have to say, Vecdarn came and rose to the occasion to help, just as a comfort, just as an ear, and hear what we're saying, and then be able to take that apart and be like, I know what we do. We've got books, we've got wet artifacts, we have wet collections. We're going to call Deborah. She's going to take care of it. And her yeah, team well, was awesome. I just want to say, yeah, I'll just give a little recap since, since Laura is here. And so it was really interesting to hear her talk. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. A little better. And um, so to hear you recap this really sort of shifted my perspective a little bit. When I showed up to the, um, so how this all rolled out for us, Dartmouth was very generous and gave all of the staff essentially a volunteer day to go help with the flooding. And uh, my coworker, Jamie Dalton said, why don't us as a department, you know, put ourselves out there to volunteer? And so I reached out to Rachel. Rachel was certainly the fulcrum point for Laura and um, put us in touch. And I think at that point, the missive was that the Morrill Homestead needed a team to come and help remove books from the library. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, we could do more than that, but yeah, we'll help out with taking books and keeping them in order. So when we showed up, um, there was a huge team of people, which I think were those friends of the Historical Society or maybe friends of, Members of the society. society. Mostly the Division for Historical 
uh, right. So there was like a lot of volunteers like ready to help, and um, then yeah, then at that point, and I soon discovered that like Laura was the point person. And I'm thinking like you know so, and she was you, you held fast. I gotta say you were like. Boom, because once we discovered that there were collections in the basement that were completely wet, I'm thinking we need to switch gears here. And you know, can we wait to get the books out of the library? And Laura's like, no. <laughs> so, it, but it all worked out. And now it makes sense, you know, that the books need to be out. That was the first priority. I think Laura had excellent vision and the big scope. You know, I think that was probably, yeah, a super challenge to get that big picture out there because you had so much going on and you know once the day got moving and then I realized there were these different sections and then I'll just jump in and I can take it, over here but but a building really with nice. many doors because <laughs> then we could have things happening in different doors right and they weren't getting in each other's way yeah I kept going to Laura like where what are we doing what are we doing <laughs> and you were great all right so I'm going to do both a little reading and that was such a great talk today I mean really inspirational um, okay, let me get this going here. Where's the forward button? All right, well, as you saw, this is the, the education center. So this is where we showed up uh, on that day. And this is our team unpacking the books. Let me, I'm gonna move this over for a minute. Um, and it was really great, you know, and the one thing I learned is like, People show up, they want to do, do, do really quick. And so like people were like uh, taping up boxes, things were coming off the shelf. I'm like, no, no, wait, wait, slow down. And we were very fortunate to have a librarian who had actually done like a move and was really familiar with a numbering system and a labeling system. So we got different teams set up. One was like uh, taping up the boxes, other people taking off the shelf, labeling where they came off the shelf. So, it was, so I hope that they are labeled. I think those are the books that are here right now. Is that true? Okay. And then, as I mentioned, we discovered the items in the basement. And as Laura mentioned, they were in the basement because the Stratford Historical Society was undergoing a restoration. And, you know, the, the big challenge, you know, things were coming out of the basement really quickly. Um, and because these different sections had been set up, all of the stuff from the historical society was coming into this one area. And Simone Pyle, Pyle, Pyle was there. And she is actually a volunteer, but she was the one who really knew the collections. And I gotta tell you, that is one of the hardest positions to be in because some of the materials that came out of the basement were really moldy. Um, I mean, saturated with mold. Um, so the decision is, you know, do we really make the effort to save these or should we just get rid of them because of the mold damage? Um, and so she was really on the ground trying to decide, um, you know, the priority setting. And here you can see the, the pile on the right, you know, do we salvage it? Do we, you know, get rid of it? Because it's so far gone. Um, and I think, and Rachel did show up this day because I was in a panic because I was trying to mitigate and try to organize things and get things separated into different subgroups. And Rachel's like, you know, it's okay. Just, you know, focus and just try to save as much as you can. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> just like take a breath, take a moment. Um, we did that. So the, the first day we were really fortunate because it was a lovely day and we key is we had a breeze. Moving air was, was perfect and it was a lovely, it was kind of like a day like today actually, in July. Um, we had big pieces of plastic uh, laid out and the first line that we really focused on was getting things dry. We really wanted to get the photos dry. Um, you know, these were items that could be spread out and air dry fairly quickly. Another subgroup of material were photo albums and uh, small um, standard diaries. These are small personal diaries that belong to individuals. And um, 
here you see Jackie. She was our summer intern from the Mor North Bennett Street School. And she really did a great job. She slowed down, she focused on this group of materials. She wrapped all the diaries up because we knew we were gonna take these back to Dartmouth and, and put them in a freezer. And on the, on the right hand side, she is taking photos out. Because the photo, the albums, I mean, these were, just imagine taking a book and plunging it into your bathtub and leaving it there for a week. I mean, this is how wet these things were. And as Laura said, these are the, the two guys who were bringing stuff out of the basement. I don't know how they did it. I kept looking at them going, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> they were just dripping in sweat. And here's our teams. Um, just taking a break, throwing out a smile. Um, then when we went back on the second day, unfortunately we, the weather was not holding out and it was really overcast, there was a drizzle. As Laura mentioned, the, uh, the main room of the education center had lots of doors and there was a large sort of barn door on one side. So we were able to open that and get some breeze. And I think we did have limited lights. Um, it seemed pretty dark. I think there was electricity. There was electricity. Right, so we had like, was this the backup emergency lighting? So it was, it was kind of dark in there. Um, but again, uh, at the end of the day, on the first day, we brought things inside, let them continue to air out. Um, Simone was really focused on the photographs. Uh, she had brought these lovely little bins that she could um, file the photos into. We discovered slides. There was also film that I think Rachel took, took care of. So there were other things other than the photo albums. And here's just a scene, you know, once you get a plan and you can settle down, you can kind of take a breath and slow down because the work is there, you're just, you're plugging through it. Um, here we are interleaving some of the photo albums with paper towels and um, just everyone sort of working in their own little workstation with their tasks. So at the end of the day, I ended up bringing home nine crates of material, and most of these were ledger books, account books, um, there were some printed books from the state, and, and the small miniature diaries. And here they are going into the freezer. And so, you know, what you can freeze items, you know, if you've got a lot of really wet, saturated items, when they go into the freezer, essentially it's buying you time. It halts mold growth, and it sort of puts the item in a dormant stage. Um, and they could be in the freezer for an extended amount of time. So these were in the freezer um, all the way until February 13th of this year. Um, I believe once funds were released, these were, and I worked with Rachel, we, uh, con or Rachel contracted with Polygon, which is a company who um, restores this type of material. And they were sent out for a freeze drying. And this is what like a freeze drying system looks like. Essentially, the items that are frozen go from a ice state into the gas state. So it bypasses the material becoming liquid again. It's sublimation. It's kind of like when your ice cubes disappear in your, you know, in your freezer. You go in to get some ice for your beverage and your ice cubes are gone. That's kind of what happens in this, in this process. Got that photo there, Fred? <laughs> you want to take a photo? And um, in conversation with uh, Rachel and I guess back to, and Carolyn Frieza was part of the conversation. We asked for permission to leave the diaries behind, um, using these as a workshop opportunity. Because it's so often that we train and train and train for what to do in case of a disaster, but then what do you do with materials after? You know, so these have been in a freezer for a year, or not quite a year, but um, you, know, you don't really get the opportunity to go through the process of thawing something and then repairing them. And so we, were, we organized two workshops. Um, the first workshop, and there's Brad, <laughs> um, 
was um, at the end of May, and we opened the call to local institutions. Um, we got a nice response of participants. And um, yeah, we essentially, I had never been through this process myself, so it was a learning opportunity for me. And we all got together and each um, started opening up and thawing out the diaries. So it went rather slow because again, these things were completely wet, so they came out as like a solid block of ice. And throughout the day, they, they um, relaxed, they, they did go back through the wet stage. And here you can see, I forget who that, who that was, I can't remember her, but um, you can see uh, pulling the pages apart. And just more, as the, as the diaries thawed, you can open them up. We had lots of fans going all over the place just to get that breeze and that air going. Lots of blotters that were being changed. You know, you put blotters in, they get wet, you put new blotters in. And because it was kind of a waiting time, we really took this opportunity to come together. Um, and Carolyn Frieza of, um, what's her company? Works on paper conservation down in Bellows Falls. Gave a nice little recap of some um, salvage work that she had done in Mount Peoria and lessons learned. And Rachel gave a little talk about backed on. So it was a nice little opportunity to step aside while the books were thawing. And here you can really see like the amount of blotter and really getting getting that moisture out of out of the books. There and just another close up. Yeah, it was just a it was a nice opportunity just to take time and see what it was like. Because handling wet books that are coming out of a frozen state, it's kind of, it's, it's a little unnerving kind of. They're very, very fragile. And by the end of the day, most of them, the ones in the foreground were dry, pretty much dry, and the ones in the background still need a little drying. And essentially what I did is sort of put them, shape them back into, into their original shape, and we put them under weights um, to weight them down and try to consolidate the books. And so the next workshop was then to repair these items. Um, so here you can see they have come out from under the weights. And the little slips of paper was um, the information that went with each of the diaries that Jackie had so thoughtfully you know, maintained with the original wrapping before they went into the freezer. And the repair workshop was mainly led by Joanna Pinney and Caitlin Still, uh, Katrina Stiller, who was a guest um, for the week. They were both graduate students of the Winterthur program. And the, work, the repair workshop was really lovely. It was a time to kind of slow down. Most of the same participants had come back for this workshop, who had been in the thawing workshop. And because you know, the books were dry, you could actually read them. And so it was really nice. People were reading little quotes and sharing the, the entries and the diaries with, with the rest of the workshop participants. Uh, and there's that. And what I found was so unique with this material was because they had been so saturated, the water had essentially washed all the adhesive from the books. So what was holding the books together was no longer there. So the covers were falling off, you know, the, the, the text blocks were intact because they were sewn. But most of the diaries had little pockets in the back or they had laminated components. So all of that had been um, washed away, the adhesive. So it was kind of like a puzzle putting these back together. And then some of the adhesive that had dried, that remained, was kind of cakey, so we needed to clean a lot of that off. So here you see uh, Patricia from the Maritime Museum kind of brushing off the, the debris. And again, we used wheat paste, which is a reversible adhesive. Um, the Johanna and Katrina were great in, in placing out the steps of putting the diaries back together again because sometimes you had to adhere one thing before you could do the next thing. And I think it was the first time that a lot of people had actually done some repair work. So it was, I think, a really good 
learning. Oh, there's Rachel in that picture, yeah. And then, you know, here, here then at the end of the day, we have reintroduced moisture, a lot of moisture back into the diaries, but again, lots of blotter, lots of weight, um, and they've, they all turned out really lovely for that. And then, it was too bad, but I think the, the books that had been sent out for freeze drawing came back like the Monday after the workshop. It would have been really great for the participants to see what the books were like coming back from being freeze dried. So what went out for the freeze drying, well, like I mentioned, were most of the ledger books. And here you can see we went through them. They were still pretty dirty. Um, but again, the dirt was more like adhesive kind of residue. Um, so we, we brushed everything off, wrapped them up individually in these little packets. And that's sort of the state that they were in that you see on the right. But what was also interesting, again, because the the bindings were literally falling apart. Um, it was really interesting uh, from a conservator's point of view to see some of these structures of ledger bindings. Like the one on the right was really interesting with these leather tabs. And the one on the left had this really unique stitching. So we all made uh, a model from that. Yeah, and some of the challenges, you know, we, we were in a, we felt in a rush. Laura was pretty insistent when, you know, this has got to be done in two days. Like, we don't have any, you know, there was a time frame that we had to keep a track of. So we sometimes didn't follow best practices. Um, yeah, having the right amount of supplies. The mold, the mold, I think, for me was the biggest thing. You could really smell it, especially when we went inside for the second day. And not knowing priorities. You know, working with Simone, she was really under a lot of pressure. Um, and not knowing, like, what type of materials we were dealing with up front. Um, we didn't have electricity. And then the, and the enormity of situation was, was, was quite a lot. But what went well? The state people, Laura and her team, were just so well organized. It was just really great working with them. And, you know, adapting to changes things coming out of the basement. Um, good managing of volunteers, you know, a lot of improv, you know, improvising. And the community really, I felt really pulled together. Collective partnerships were established. And, you know, we afforded learning opportunities for the salvage, you know, with the diaries at the end. And um, Devin, who was a intern at the Maritime Museum, came to both workshops and wrote a blog, which is on their website. And I just, I'll just read this. It, well, I just thought it was just a really lovely snapshot of you know, the impact of this. The recovered diaries told stories of people living in 19th century New England. The books called Standard Diaries were mass produced by only a few companies and were designed to be small enough to fit in a shirt or pants pocket with space on each page to write a brief entry for two days. The beginning pages of each diary had something like a miniature almanac. These pages were filled with information that the writer may need to reference throughout their, daily, throughout their day, from eclipse dates to interest rates. There was also a section at the end to help keep track of the finances. It was fascinating to see what was being written about in each diary. By that, I mean it was delightfully ordinary. Most books that have survived from past centuries are from people of great importance whose lives were overflowing with historical significance. These diaries, however, had a striking resemblance to the life of an average person today. The authors of these diaries wrote about cleaning the house, visiting family, and dreading their chemistry classes. Our team also enjoyed finding entries from historic days on April 15th, 1865, one author added, news came, President Lincoln dead, to an otherwise ordinary entry. It is also important to note that these standard diaries were designed to be affordable, while made of good materials with somewhat decent quality. So I was especially impressed with their good condition after the thawing and repair process. So questions? <laughs>
Yeah, we have time for questions. Thank you both. Uh, any questions from the audience? I can, sorry, Laura. Pass the mic around. Yeah, Kelly. So with the diaries, I noticed that you didn't, would you have washed them first if you had had distilled water on hand? I mean, you noted that the water wasn't no. contaminated, yeah, but. The water was clean water, and that was one of the advantages. Um, so there was no need to, to pre-wash them. So the so, dirt that you were taking off them afterwards was just like residual dirt from the building? Yeah, like uh, well, after, they had, after they had um, dried. Yeah, that was like things that were sort of left behind from the, from the diary from the get-go. And my other so, question is, yeah. so with the freeze drying process, I know if you have a book and you get it wet, you dry it, it doesn't, it doesn't go back the way it used to. Right. Does the freeze drying prevent that? Does it still stay like compact like, like a book? That's a really good question. A, a lot, most of it is determined by how they're packed. And, and that was one of like the best practices. They didn't get packed probably as good as they could have. So you want to, you know, if you do have a lot of books, ideally you pack them by size and you pack them spines down in a crate and you try to get them fairly tight because however they're packed, that's how they're gonna turn out. So some of these, I think there were two or three that had been quite distorted and I was able to like rehumidify the spine and kind of get them back into a, into a shape like after the fact, but th they, they come back exactly how they're packed <laughs> going out. Um, is there any uh, thought, uh, since you've had a chance to look through a lot of these things, of trying to microfilm or scan some of them, because you might have identified things that were really important historically that maybe had been hidden away. I, I happened to have worked on a project back in the 50 years ago at the Smithsonian to do that. I think the historical society could have done that with some of their stuff so that they had both. Um, most of the friends stuff was related to their events that they were, um, for lack of a more appropriate word, hoarding um, <laughs> from old events and they would just keep adding more. And then our stuff was already scanned um, and it was just sitting there for the seven year time period before the state lets us throw it out. But um, the other things that were in the building were books you know, that Justin Morrill had touched and written in and from his time in the Senate and from his time designing the house. And you can't really replace that the same way, but we've had conversations. Yeah, yeah I was thinking the diaries. Well, we've had conversations to scan them so that more people can see them and experience them. And even uh, during COVID, we had projects where we were transcribing them and people around the country, you know, here, take a chapter of this and figure out the handwriting and type it up. But yes, there is that opportunity. It's a funding and capacity issue. Well, I'm just thinking that since you've identified it and you already know that they're in danger potentially in the future, it might be a good idea to, to reproduce them. Yeah, and that, that really does lie with the historical society because it's their material. Um, I will say that one of the formats that we found at the very end of the day was a, an innocuous cardboard box that had 26 or so uh, film cans in it, it's mostly 16 millimeter, mostly from like the 40s. So I, I took those home, kept them in water. Fred, Fred. Fred! Fred helped get them to a vendor because that takes specialized expertise. Those are in the process of being digitized as, you know, first go through a restoration process and then digitization. Uh, one of the things that Vactarn was able to help Stratford Historical Society with and a, num and a, a handful of others was, was providing some funding for this work. It is not cheap. 
Um, and I will say that Polygon is the disaster, the document recovery company that the state has a contingency contract with. So we've gone through the process of vetting them, put out a bid to have requests from, for proposals from a number of different vendors, identified Polygon as the one we had initially, and we were in the process of re-upping with them that July. Um, so they're the ones that we've negotiated lowest price offer for different services that they provide. Um, we have to make it clear that the state does not pay for their services, but you are able to call upon that contract if you need it. And we opened it up so it's not just for state records and municipal records, but also can be called on and invoked by any historical society or other record holding um, institution in Vermont. Any other questions? Yes, Fred. have a question, but I was at the Diary Restoration Conference at the end of May, and it was just amazing. Uh, Deborah introduces us and feeds us, et cetera, then she gets these frozen things out of, and they are hard. <laughs> and she's coaching us, we all get our diary, and we, we start to, we use hair dryers to warm it up, and then, and then Deborah says, okay, we're gonna go, we'll watch a movie, or, <laughs> And we came back and it's opening up. By the end of the day, and we're putting paper and soaking up, by the end of the day, this diary um, is readable and ready to go to the next thing. And, we've, and we're reading about the events of the day and it was really cool. Thanks, Any other questions or comments? People who've been through similar situations at their repositories. Well, thank you very much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day at uh, the Day of Learning. The next event is lunch, back where we started today, so we can make our way back down the hill. Thank you again.